President Bradley asks National Population Commission to return verifiable and accurate data as trial centers progresses. If think candidates contesting or show governorship election, commit to peaceful exercise. It is not enough to simply sign the what is more important is to abide by its letter and spirit. Nigeria optimistic of brighter regional block as new ECOWAS leadership comes in view. Hello, good morning, Nigeria. Today we shall discuss security for custodial centers. So in recent years, the Nigerian custodial centers across the country have been under attacks by known gunmen, thereby leading to the unlawful release of thousands of inmates, including some condemned and hardened criminals, awaiting trial. Now, there are reports that the violent attacks on uh, custodial centers assumed a disturbing dimension since the NSAS protest of uh, 2020, during which some correctional facilities were destroyed in Edo and Ondo states. Now, other correctional facilities attacks will include Bochi, Imo, those in Kogi, Lagos, Jos, and of course the latest being the Kogi Medium Security Custodial Center here in Abuja. Now, according to the Nigerian Correctional uh, Services, the uh, service uh, suffered about uh, 30 attacks on custodial centers from 2009 till date. Well, those attacks, according to the authorities, usually occur in facilities with, with large number of awaiting trial inmates. However, some uh, analysts have identified structural defects poor security features, uh, the shortage of armed personnel and weapons required to guard the facilities as some of the factors making them susceptible to attacks by criminals. Same story you would say, but how can the correctional facilities be protected from the attacks and what kind of synergy is required among the security agencies for intelligence sharing and how effective will the special security team set up by the service to secure the custodial centers be? Why are criminals now targeting correctional facilities? These are some of the questions we intend to seek answers to on today's edition of Good Morning Nigeria. It's a warm welcome to all of you wherever you're watching us from. I am Claire Adilabu Abdurazak. And I'm Kingsley Osadolo. I join Claire to also welcome you to the program as always live on the network service of Africa's largest television network, the Nigerian Television Authority. In line with our tradition, we shall also have our supplementary segments in the course of the program and there's a tour business and new super review. For now, the highlights of the morning news by Musbao Dan Wahab. Good morning, Musbao. Very good morning, Kinsley and Claire. Welcome to the news. President Muhammad Buhari on Wednesday formally presented himself and his household in Dara to enumerators of National Population Commission NPC as part of the ongoing dress rehearsal for the forthcoming national headcounts. The president who received the team led by the chairman of the commission, Nasir Issa Kwara, taxed them to justify the confidence of the government by returning very viable and accurate data. Mr. President is giving us the support to do this because Nigeria has stayed for a long time without accurate uh, population and the housing census uh, data. So we are happy Mr. President has been given this support and uh, we urge all Nigerians to give the support uh, to the Commission 
and its functionaries whenever they come calling to be able to get the data that will analyze uh, and uh, prepare for national planning uh, for the development of this country. And in politics, uh, the national chairman of the All Progressives Congress, APC, Abdullahi Adamu, is assuring the nation's Christian community agitated by the Muslim Muslim presidential ticket of the party that they have absolutely nothing to worry about as the interest of everyone will be protected. The chairman gave the assurance while addressing journalists in Dara Kassina State after an audience with President Mohammed Buhari. We appreciate that the Christians are interested in it, no doubt about it. But the fact of the matter is, uh, we are as practical as we can in this situation, and uh, we do hope that people will see reason. Nobody is wanting to promote Christianity or Muslim ticket necessarily, but uh, we have to face the reality of our politics in the country, and that's what we are doing. So you have nothing to fear? And, uh, Absolutely nothing to fear. Uh, Shetima is another Nigerian like me and you, and uh, yes, we don't all have to be Muslims or all have to be Christians. It is the will of God that this time around he's going to be the vice president of the great country if we win the election. And we do hope and pray and we are working to win the election. Fifteen candidates contesting the Ashun State governorship election this Saturday have committed themselves to a violence-free and peaceful election before, during and after the exercise. They made their commitments in Oshogbo, Ashun State's capital, while signing a peace accord organized by the National Peace Committee. Enough to simply sign the peace accord. What is more important is to abide by letter and spirit. This is a military official commitment. The amount of violence that has involved our nation for me is a fundamental threat to our democracy. And those who run the system must demonstrate commitment, capacity to arrest this threat. And away from local politics, Nigeria is optimistic about the new turnaround in the ECOWAS administration, hoping that the challenges of increased restiveness, political hop heavers, and support of a region will be addressed and better economic progression realized. In a message to the ECOWAS community, President Mohamed Buhari believes that the future of a bloc in global affairs is bright in view of the resources and resilience typifying the member nations. I renew our commitment to work diligently for the welfare of our community. At the same time, I call upon you to continue to support ECOWAS by ensuring the full payment of the community levy and the full implementation of ECOWAS protocols. Emir of Dara Umar Farouk Umar has called on President Muhammad Buhari to continue to be patient, tolerant and focused on his genuine efforts as achieving a greater Nigeria. The Emir who received a Nigerian leader at his palace said that posterity will judge him right. And just you know, some petrol stations in Abuja and eight environs are selling fuel to motorists at the price of 185 naira per litre and above. Many now are asking if they surprise broadly on display is a new pump price of petrol. This one is well, it's not even the issue. We there be fuel. Because I have to drive from, I left airport to this place just to buy fuel. Other filling station is still locked. So if this 184 will, add, will actually create way for all the other filling stations to have fuel. So it's better because we know it will never go down. Bayelsa State's government has donated additional 28 operational vehicles of the State Police Command. Governor Doe Diri, who made the presentation, urged security operatives to effect the release of former Commissioner for Special Duties, Mike Ogiasa, who has been kidnapped for about a month ago. What is used to terrorize and intimidate your brother, your own sisters. And I'd like to appeal to us 
Ambassador News for now. Good morning, Nigeria. We return in just a moment after this break with Claire and Kisley. Stay with us. Every morning is an opportunity to take your hustle to the next level. Every morning is one day closer to your ambition. So, make every morning count. Come after come. Morning after morning. Start strong. Finish strong. Nescafe. <laughs> Glorious Vision University Ogwa, Edo State, is poised to deliver world-class education rooted in strong academic traditions. In the colleges of law, basic and applied sciences, humanities, management and social sciences, Glorious Vision University is building the next generation of leaders. Or we now for 2022-2023 undergraduate and postgraduate admissions into any of our NUC fully accredited programs. Secure admission today in one of the fastest growing private universities in Africa. Also note that the university runs diploma, GPM, part-time, and tuition fee programs in all colleges. For more information, visit www.sau.edu.ng or call 0705-079-1226. Glorious Vision University, the nurture for discipline and excellence. Lalo. But Lalo, Nigeria are the ninth champions in this competition. The 12th edition of the Africa Women's Cup of Nations is here with 12 teams including reigning champions and nine-time winners, Super Falcons of Nigeria, all in contention from July 2 to 23 in Rabat, Morocco. You can catch all the actions live on the NTA Network Service and NTA Sports 24, Channel 270 on Star Times, 434 on Starsat and 731 on Free TV. Come, join us to promote another championship round by the Super Falcons. Falcons. For your advert placement, please call Hawa on 0803-312-1022. Africa Women's Cup of Nations, Rabat 2022. Game on! This is Good Morning Nigeria Live on the network service of the NTA. Time to take a look at business uh stories now and uh opec uh is saying that uh nigeria's crude oil production increased to an average of 1.238 million barrels per day and that was in june 2022 for the news of this and more here is alika Okwanachi arua OPEC made this known in its oil market report for July 2022. The report said the figure showed an increase of 5,000 barrels per day when compared to 1.233 million barrels per day produced averagely in the month of May 2022. The report said despite the improvement in fossil fuel prices, the short-term economic outlook for Nigeria was clouded by high inflation, which had reduced private sector optimism and weakened consumer spending. 
in taking a look at Wednesday tradings on the floor of the exchange. <music> With business news, Alika Okwanachi, Harua. Thank you very much, Alika, for the business package. Up next for us is Newspaper Review. And here is uh, Bayo at Toyebe to do the needful. Good morning, Bayo. Good to see you. Thank you, Claire. Good morning. Good morning, Kensley. Good morning, Nigeria. All right, uh, Bayo, uh, we have uh, the leadership newspaper to begin with. Mm -hmm. And stories, of course, are on uh, crude oil, uh, sorry, and uh, uh, the price of uh, petroleum products as well as uh, politics. Now, price adjustment will end fuel scarcity. That's according to marketers. Price adjustment will end fuel scarcity. That's a claim by marketers. Uh, United Kingdom, Nigeria bond came in among top six contenders for Boris Johnson's job. That's to say, to become uh, the next prime minister of Britain. Uzo demands 783,084 dollar wrist watch can build state-of-the-art hospital and roads. That's uh, a report there on page <laughs> 7 of the paper. Once again, Uzo Dumas $783,084 wristwatch can build state-of-the-art hospital and roads. Inspector General of Police bans use of uh, SPY number plates nationwide. IGP bans use of SPY number plates nationwide. Police arrests fleeing Kujo prison SKP in Ogun. Muslim Muslim ticket. You have nothing to fear. APC assures Christians. It's an act of God, Adamu. Ignore religion, vote competence, accredited the looters, Nigerians. Tinubu's wife will be unofficial Christian VP, says Masari. Atiku and VP governors for Oshun Mega Rally today. Details of that on page 17. Claire. Well, quite interesting stories. You have Kinsley. Uh, Ajuzira has that lead story. For the hours to Oshun Guba, Uyetola Adiliki order signed peace deal. And the riders, INEC pledges transparency. I park cautions against intimidation, violence, while police on red alert. And uh, there are other stories trending. Just a bit uh, down the picture story. Power generation struggles at 4,000 megawatts amid huge demand. Power generation struggles at 4,000 megawatts amid huge demand. Now, Lagos Assembly debunks secret passage of Sharia bill. Lagos Assembly debunks secret passage of Sharia bill. And just uh, let me return to the picture story. And that's, of course, um, uh, Kassina State Governor Aminu Masuri, President Mohamed Buhari, Chairman National Population Commission, uh, all, of course, during the trial census exercise by the NPC in Dara, Katsina State. And that was yesterday. Other stories trending just uh, at the right hand column. By your left, I'm not leaving anything to inherit that's uh, attributed to President Buhari on page 9. Banks spend $6.9 billion on welfare packages for CEOs and MDs. Banks spend $6.9 billion naira on welfare packages for CEOs and MDs. Now, 2023, Kwanko so, so show rights names missing on the INEC portal. And Pope makes first women appointment to Bishop's Advisory Committee. Nami urges contribution to tax development. And uh, 
uh, I'm looking at uh, audio stories from the nation. I'll uh, just start from above the nameplate. Dangote, only African and Bloomberg's top 100 rich list. Dangote, only African on Bloomberg's top 100 rich list. It's on page 8. And 448 jostling for 28 governorship seats. And the NNPPAAC yet to send list. Details of that you can read up on page 5. COVID-19 cases rise sharply in July. And Buari, I'm leaving no inheritance for my children. I'm leaving no inheritance for my children. Page 5. Now, Ocean 2022. We tell our delicate other sign piece of code. Peter will be campaigns for last one in Oshobo. Islamic group ex students back Ogoyebi. Now, governors, Muslim, Muslim ticket not against Christian. There are riders to that effect. And again, you see that picture story just also. Uh, the president, of course, uh, uh, giving his vitals during the trial census by NPC in Dara, Kasuna City yesterday. You fixed lecturers' wages unilaterally. Government tells ASU. You fixed lecturers' wages unilaterally. Government tells ASU. Proposal will cost government 1.2 trillion naira. No agreement yet on the table. Now, 165 petrol pump price no longer realistic. Say marketers, Bio, mm. we have a long list. Yes, let's start with the what is happening. 13 political parties yesterday in Osu signed and committed to peace before, during, and after the Osu governorship election coming up on Saturday. Speaking at the ceremony, uh, the one of the persons in charge of midwifing it under the auspices of the National Peace Committee, the Catholic Bishop of uh, Sokoto, Matthew Kuka urge political parties to work towards peace. He stressed that Nigeria is in their need of peaceful environment and political actors need to be encouraged to think towards peace. Adding that violence has been one of the main uh, setbacks for the nation and Nigerians need peace so that democracy can thrive. Uh, also at the ceremony, the INEC chairman, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, uh, assured that the commission has taken steps to ensure that the election on Saturday will, will be free, fair and credible and enjoyed participants to abide by the peace accord. The Inspector General of Police was represented by DIG Johnson Kukuma and he promised that Saturday's election will witness improved security far, far better than what was witnessed in Ekiti. And on the issue of the same fit presidential and running mate, the Pentecostal Fellowship of Nigeria says that the decision to fly same fit presidential and running mate for 2023 election by a political party is unacceptable. The Kasuduna State Chairman Apostle Emmanuel Bako says that this new trend of fielding flag bearers of same fit is not sense, uh, consistent with the federal system of our country. It is not only disregarding our heterogeneous nature, but has also uh, set, has the potential to polarize the, the nation. Meanwhile, Governor Ruth Miyakere Dulu of Ondo State has appealed to Nigerians to ignore the issue of religion, but vote for competent candidates that will work to deliver results. The governor says um, Muslim, Muslim, ticket, Muslim Muslim ticket has nothing to do with the performance. He said... Let's vote for someone that can do something and walk and stop the uh, because the book stops at the table of the president. He says the president you are voting for is the one in charge. He takes all decisions, and therefore, uh, whether Muslim, Muslim, Muslim or not, or Christian, Christian, uh, the <coughs> concern should be competence. And he emphasized that we in the southwest fought for this for the candidate to come to the south and religion should not be a, a deciding factor now on the issue of uh, the escape from uh, kuji the Oguse police command in his vigilance got intelligence and captured one yakubu abdul mumini who had escaped from the kuji prison he was captured at uh, sango uh, this, this is why it is good to say when you see something say something uh, citizen saw something 
and they help in providing the credible evidence. And upon interview, the SPP confessed that yes, he was actually convicted by a high court in uh, Kogi for conspiracy and culpable homicide. And he was uh, being held in Kuge prison. Meanwhile, our Super Falcons have qualified for the quarterfinal and will today be playing the Lionesses of Cameroon to qualify for a semi-final berth. Uh, a former Super Eagles player and Olympic medalist has advised the Super Eagles not to be, uh, not to be intimidated by the bully tactics of the Cameroonian players because they are very physical in the approach. He says they should be able to hold their own against the lioness of Cameroon. And indeed, the last time the lioness played, played, we played them in Cameroon, in their own den, the lioness's den, and we were able to beat them 2-1. <laughs> are, are you trying to calm me down? Are, are you trying to... <laughs> are you allowed? <laughs> uh, very quickly, uh, by, uh, two, uh, two stories that uh, are of uh, interest to me. Happily, you've already touched on the arrest of another SKP in Ogun State. And, and it is important that it is information from citizens that have led to most of these re-arrests. Yes. Uh, with the exception, perhaps, of the former of the Boko Haram uh, uh, inmate who was picked up at, at Area Motor 1, Park. At Area 1 Motor Park here in Abuja. That was done by the NDLEA. Uh, and they, uh, they should be commended for that because they caught him uh, with uh, three wraps of Indian hemp. Uh, so he had quickly uh, tried to recharge himself uh, while uh, seeking to board the vehicle to go to uh, Maduguri. So it's important, as you indicated, uh, see something, say something, report to the authorities, and once there are suspicious uh, persons or suspicious movements around your location, let the authorities know. Pretty good. The uh, second point has to do with what President Muhammad Buhari said about not leaving uh, any inheritance mm -hmm. for his children. I think sometimes that, that story uh, could be uh, misunderstood uh, because he was talking about saying that the greatest legacy he's given to his children is education and that he had put them on notice that everyone must be educated. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, from uh, the details of the story on page 6 of the mm -hmm. leadership newspaper, is that, and I quote, says, uh, my focus has always been on training the children to be relevant wherever they find themselves. I told my children, particularly the girls, that they can only get married after getting the first degree. Mm. You cannot get a first degree before age uh, 20. So, uh, if, if the president has taken this route, uh, it should be one that should be emulated uh, by all that, so that the is incidents of uh, uh, childhood marriages can be considerably minimized. And let's face it, uh, an educated woman is an asset not just to the family, but to the community and ultimately to the nation. Yes, you educate a woman, you educate a nation. You educate a nation. Mm -hmm. the, the hand that rocks the cradle uh, rules the world. So if a woman is properly educated and she's strong and firm, she will, of course, uh, be a good. I mean, let's, I'm not. I'm not diminishing the role of women in other in other fields. Be a good homemaker, raise uh, children properly, of course, along with the, with the husband, and then be able to also participate in, in in the running of any business, in the running of any office. Because by the time you start having children at age 13, age 14, 15, I mean, what time are you then going to have to grow? Mm. And I believe, I believe you, you, you both have say, said it also, mm -hmm. and I want to appreciate you, so I wouldn't say anything other than just to be a bit cynical about emulating the president. Nigerians will not emulate such things, I'm, I'm telling you. They, they only tell you things, Lee. I mean, it's the president's prerogative. Mm -hmm. But again, that's very fundamental. Yes, it's very critical and but, it yeah. has impact. The three quick issues. Yeah, sorry, before you one go. about marketers and the petrol. Uh, yeah, marketers, and that's a lingering one. Mm -hmm. It looks like a point of blackmail now. Yes, that you know that this year had been chaotic in terms of fuel supplies, at least for us here in the federal capital territory and in some parts of the country. You recall we started off with uh, the so-called off-spec uh, petrol. Uh, that came in, the number of vehicles were damaged and we all incurred cost in that regard and they have hazard supplies. That's one. I'm sure we can get into that. The, the one I'm, I'm also concerned about has to do with the uh, directive by the Inspector General of Police 
banning the use of SPY uh, number plates, the super numeral that you used to find. Uh, it's normally issued for special purposes and individuals who have a need for it can apply and there are rigorous procedures. But it, it has become a status symbol. And it's abused. Abused. Ab uh, grossly abused. Yes. You know, if you recall, in the uh, up to the 80s, uh, and I believe up to the 90s, uh, before the, it was cracked, one of the most prestigious uh, uh, plate numbers that you had had to do with the CVU. CVU, that was a government, uh, a government issue. Yeah, yeah. yeah CVU, Conference and Visitors Unit. Unit. Yes. You know, if you had that, if you, I mean, if you were a VIP and you came into town and they used the CVU to convey you, in a sense, you had immunity. Uh, even so, from traffic offenses and so on and so forth, but CVUs have been scrapped, they're no longer mm. part of the government fleet. But SPY, I and mean, you find all kinds sometimes there are persons, it is alleged, of questionable character, yes. you know, we're using SC, uh, uh, SPY uh, plate numbers. Uh, but we will see how this directive will be enforced <laughs> because we were told, we were told at the beginning of the administration Firstly. of the new IG as. At work with some other edges, withdraw all policemen on private guard duties. You have over a hundred thousand of them on private guard duties. Fifty thousand. Yeah, nobody, nobody uh, respected that directive, and so you still have persons on private guard duties when there is crisis or conflict. People are attacking Kuji. Everyone, with those of police officers, and of course some other security men, they are on private guard duties. So it was because the order was withdrawn because immediately after it was issued, yes, that those who were benefiting from it protested. Yes, and they had to. What was, the was the basis for the protest? Yeah. What was the basis for the withdrawal? The rest of society doesn't deserve protection. That's what I'm saying. I mean, you issue the directive, and then nobody obeys it. You talk about SPY. Let us see who will obey it. What about marketers are saying? Glasses. Yeah, glasses. glasses. God bless you. <laughs> they will issue. They will. They will also uh, sometimes issue. Uh, come, uh, come to get permits. Uh, uh, no, no, they, they, permit. Yeah, that's one. But they would also sometimes uh, issue an exception to say that uh, if it is factually made, factory made exempted. Uh, but those that had stickers, dark stickers mm. placed on them. Mm. In fact, the police forcefully removed them. See, if if. It is if it is factory fitted. Yes. The requirement then should be for all vehicles coming into Nigeria should or not. being produced in Nigeria should not have tinted glasses. If they have tinted glasses, the customs should not clear them. Yes, it doesn't meet uh, import specification. Yes, yes. That's, that's it doesn't meet it. So, mm. but if you don't grant the ex ex exception, now anybody just so bring it. It's uh, it's tinted, uh, tinted it's, glasses, it's, and then it's factory fitted. Factory fitted, and then you have all kinds of. Sometimes when you see some of the uh, young men. Uh, and, and women in those uh, vehicles, you just said to yourself, All right, I mean, we are in for it. Bye. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. And let's put our hands together, you know, cross for the super eagles. I mean, super falcons. Super falcons. Super falcons, yes. And uh, I, I, I didn't watch the Morocco. Uh, Botswana final yesterday, but Morocco was leading just few minutes to the end of the match. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, I'm sure, I, I'm most certain they, they won the, the match. All right, so, Bayo, thank you. Have a thank good week. Time. We'll see you tomorrow. Right. This is Good Morning Nigeria. We'll take a short break. When we come back, we'll take on our discussion. You're watching Good Morning Nigeria on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. Now we are having a conversation on security for custodial centers, as they are now known. Otherwise, uh, we used to call them prisons. Now, for a background to that report, let's listen to our correspondent, Mohammed Nathala. For some time now, there has been incessant attacks on custodial centers across Nigeria. From Boji to Shagamu, just to undo Imo, Koji, Lagos, and the recent one, at the Kujie Custodial Center. The unknown gunmen unleashed mayhem on the facilities and unlawfully released hardened criminals being held for various criminal activities, most of them against the state. The recent attack on Kujie Custodial Center left many Nigerians wondering about the motive behind the action, which lasted for some hours. Top government functionaries, including President Mohamed Buhari, paid an assessment visit to the facility. President Buhari expressed disappointment over the attack. The most disappointing thing is the intelligence system. How can the 
terrorists or whoever they are organize themselves have weapons come and attack this high security facility and get away with it fct is supposed to is have ha, has the seat of government and today that seat of government is not safe so we we have to do whatever it takes to get everybody back the effect of our effectiveness in degrading rising them in the north is, is what we are witnessing so they are scattered all over the place as sad as it is we must put whatever is happening in the context of the asymmetric warfare unleashed on the nation by these criminal elements and we will rise to it that is what i want to give to the statistics show that more than 7,000 inmates escaped from custodial centers across the country since 2015, out of which about 600 escaped from Kujie custodial centers. However, scores of the escapees have been rearrested and returned to the facility, according to authorities. Reports indicate that most of the attacks are usually on the center where there are a large number of awaiting trial inmates. So what is the motive behind the attack on custodial centers? Why are the inmates not prosecuted to decongest the custodial centers across the country? What should be done to fortify the centers considering the fact that other hardened criminals are still being held there? These and more issues guests will be talking about on Good Morning Nigeria. <laughs> All right, thank you, Natalia, for the package. Uh, let me welcome to the studio our guests, uh, all seated. Uh, first is Dr. Kabiru Adamu, security risk and management expert who just turned golden. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> also, we have here with us Francis N. Nobore, former PRO Nigerian Correctional Service. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. When you were there, it was not correctional service, was it? It was my dear president. Yeah, president. Now, correctional, <laughs> correctional so he, of course, he uh, retired as uh, a controller of uh, the uh, correctional uh, service. Uh, and by the way, just uh, clear, uh, we were congratulating the Dr. Kabir Adabu. Congratulations to him as well. Now, uh, just before we uh, got back on that, we were teasing him about the cake. Uh, and he said that he was in a hurry to get into the studios, uh, so he missed out on the cake. So our intention was to send him back uh, to get the cake so that we all have a bite uh, of it. He's a regular <laughs> guest on Good Morning Nigeria. <laughs> well, you have right of reply. A reply. Uh, he's a regular guest on Good Morning Nigeria. We are so delighted uh, on, on this occasion. All right. Uh, we also have with us in the studios here Chiji, uh, uh, a major the publisher of Security Digest. Uh, Chidi, we're glad to have you on the program. Thank you for having me. And from our Enugu Network Center, we've been joined by Dr. Uju Agobo, Executive Director of Prisoners Rehabilitation and Welfare Action, PRAWA. Uh, Dr. Uju Agobo, well, you haven't changed your name, and I'm sure that's the name you were registered with, but uh, Prisoners uh, is a living <laughs> in, in this of consumer centers. <laughs> Dr. Uju Agobo, I'd like to have you on the program this morning. Very much, I'm glad to be here. Okay, well, of course, the immediate background to today's conversation is the uh, assault on uh, Kuji Medium uh, Security Correctional uh, Center, uh, probably the worst of its kind uh, in, in terms of uh, attacks on, uh, again, you pardon me if I uh, use uh, correctional mm -hmm. center, custodial center, and prisons interchangeably uh, is the worst of, of, of the assaults. We do know that the facility, uh, Kotun Karfe, which is near Lokoja, uh, had also repeatedly come uh, under assault, but never uh, in terms of uh, the weaponry uh, and the audacity of, uh, of the assault on uh, Kuji prison had previously been witnessed uh, in, in our history. Let, let's begin with uh, Francis Enabori, who is, of course, uh, who was uh, in, in, in the service. How did you receive the news of what happened at, uh, at Kuji? I mean, was it that, oh, I mean, we expected this? Uh, well, uh, thank you very much once again. Um, there's no doubt that uh, the invasion of uh, Kujie Custodial Center came to us as a, 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 a huge, uh, you know, surprise. Uh, it was uh, just like you said, the audacity and the weaponry that uh, uh, was uh, deployed. 
to prosecute that uh, dastardly act. Uh, something that uh, nobody ever uh, envisaged. Uh, is um, it, it, the attention and the concern that the, that unfortunate incident uh, generated since it happened is uh, is understandable. Uh, going by the caliber of persons uh, that were in custody and uh, uh, also got uh, uh, released. Uh, I think the, the starting point, like I used to say, is that uh, uh, yes, it's sad that it happened. I think uh, I, I would suggest that uh, uh, we deploy more energy and resources and uh, past time to estimate what happened. How do we stop that only uh, uh, incident from repeating itself? Because we still have hiding criminals behind bars all over the place. What do we do differently now to stop this incessant uh, violation of our custodial center? I think uh, uh, that's, that would be a good uh, uh, entry point to this uh, important okay. discourse. You, you, you said you were surprised. Why? Yes, uh, going by the nature of uh, the security uh, arrangement, uh, you know, put uh, 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 on ground there. That's like uh, Kujé. Yes, Kujé. Uh, if you go to Kujé, for the ordinary man, as you are approaching Kujé, you see the retinue of security operatives on ground there, from the military to the police to NSCDC to armed squad uh, unit of the Nigerian Correctional Service to uh, DSS and all of that. Ordinarily, you see the place as a fortress. But having it violated is, uh, to some extent, it will... It will come to someone as a surprise. Well, uh, let me uh, uh, reframe that uh, that uh, uh, perception. Uh, yes, it came as a surprise because you see the structure, you say, okay, well, this has a semblance of a maximum, uh, uh, a maximumly secured environment. But if you study the environment further, and you just oppose it with what you see in other climes. A situation where you have a custodial facility that is housing uh, highly prized individuals. There are features that were obviously absent. In other climes, you have double perimeter fence. The first perimeter fence is to delay. Remember the beza of... Uh, uh, security management, you talk about uh, detection, you talk about uh, deterrence, you talk about delay, you talk about denial before you talk about defense. We don't have that in Kujé. What that portends is that whoever is coming to violate the environment will not have the, uh, the, 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 the buffer area that will enable those on guard duty to profile whoever is violating uh, the, 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 the sanctity of the environment. It's not there. So it's 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 it, it, it's a uh, it cause for concern. That's why I'm saying uh, as we progress, we may be able to express certain things that we need to put in place to stop for that violation. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Francis. We'll come back to you because of the conversation. I, I'd like us to also go to uh, Doctor Uju uh, Agomo in our Enugu Network Center. Of course, uh, you 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 have visitations to. Uh, our correctional facilities uh, may you be in and out in terms of seeing uh, the uh, the inmates of, of those facilities and the structures uh, of the facilities and the conditions uh, under which uh, the inmates uh, live and then uh, uh, work in there uh, temporarily for whatever uh, uh, reasons. In your opinion, what has made uh, our correctional facilities so vulnerable to uh, incessant attacks, of course, which has been highlighted uh, by the Kujé prison assault. Okay, some bits of what you said cut off, but let me first say that I am not surprised. I am not surprised because, as we know, if the prison is a reflection of what happens in the commun wider community. I am not surprised because the clear 
provisions of the Nigerian Correctional Service Act of 2019 that should help us forestall what happened in Kuji and other places have not been put in place. Section 28 of that act clearly explains the things that need to happen, starting from every maximum security facility and indeed any facility harboring high risk offenders. Francis, I actually mentioned the issue of uh, double parameter war. It's there in the law. There are scanners, there's so many things put in there, but it hasn't been implemented. And please let me also use this opportunity to plead and plead again. We need to ensure that all maximum security facilities in this country comply with the provisions of Section 28 of the Nigerian Correctional Service Act of 2019. We also need to ensure that the provisions of Section 12, subsection 4 to 12 of the Nigerian Correctional Service is ASAP immediately embarked upon. And what does that provision say? That every facility that has exceeded its designated capacity should immediately control, deal with that by setting off what is called the early warning signals. Letters to the Chief Judge, the Attorney General of the States, Prerogative of Mercy Committee of the State, Justice Reform Team of the States, so that that number is reduced. Again, in the same light, I am pleading that the provisions of Part 2 of the Nigerian Correctional Service Act of 2019, which is about the implementation of non-custodial measures, happens immediately so that those persons who are not high risk are removed from that facility. So, so that the facility will be adequate for the proper rehabilitation taking place, which is not really happening. So, there, yes, there's a need for funding. And you, in the introductory comment, it was mentioned that all the places, and indeed you are correct, all the places that they have been attacked have been places that we have a high number of persons who have not been convicted. 70%, over 70% of those who are in our custody across the country have not been convicted. And something has to happen. I said it before, but let me say it again. As a nation now, if this be the only thing coming out of Kujie for us, Kujie attack for us, now as a nation, we need to declare a state of emergency in terms of justice, security sector reform. And I mean now. And again, this perhaps may have flagged the need because oftentimes people do not see corrections as that important. But now they can understand. You can't do anything in terms of security and justice if you are not also ensuring that the Nigerian Correctional Service and indeed all correctional activities are actually taken care of in terms of proper logistics, proper fortification. So I, I, again, I, I say I am not surprised. But I also think that we need to do more than we are doing now as a nation. Thank you, Dr. Ojo Agomo, uh, for your opening remarks. We back to our studio, and let me uh, bring in Dr. Kabiru Adamo here. We're talking about, you know, we, we've talked about the structural defects and the need, of course, for you know more fortification of the structures that we whoever you know tries to gain entrance, of course, will uh, get some form of um, you know. Uh, restriction but let's look at the perpetrators of the attack and what is the motivation uh as we've noticed most of the correctional or custodial centers house hardened criminals terrorists and you know other you know those on on remand you know purposes and all that what is actually the driving factor is it to to an affront on our security architecture? Uh, are we being attacked externally? W w what is it? Thank you, uh, Claire. Uh, let me start by, first of all, uh, commending uh, you know, your, your station, um, riding on what Dr. Uju said. This is a matter that requires national attention. Um, by the very nature of national security, the essence of having a custodial center or a prison is fundamental to the achievement of the objectives of any national security. The society has decided that there are certain persons who should not be part of the, the society for a lot of reasons. They may have committed offenses, they are suspects, and the essence of that custodial center is to keep them until such a time that there is a determination for them to return back That's to society. Now, unfortunately, from when answers happened up until now, 
we have documented at least and I say this with all sense of responsibility and this is very conservative. At least 6,000 of such inmates that have been released to society. Among those 6,000, there are hardened criminals, there are terrorist suspects, there are individuals that have committed atrocities, you know, including gender-based violence. Name them. They should not be part of our society and are now out of our society. So how do we intend to achieve the objectives of our national security when we cannot keep subset individuals within the custodial center that we have designated in the first place as part of that security architecture. So I want to start on that foundation, riding on what Dr. Uju said. It's absolutely important and I'm happy that the nas last National Security Council meeting actually deliberated on that and we've been told that a committee has been set up to investigate particularly the Kujie incident. Now, before then, we are aware that especially the Ministry of Interior under the then General Dambazo had set up a committee that had gone round all the custodial prisons, custodial centers that we had at that time. And I'm aware that that committee made far-reaching recommendations. So we do have at least some basis with which to begin our reform. Apart from the law, laws and then the reports of these committees, there are several other postulations, pre reports, presentations that have been made regarding the circumstances and what we need to do um, about our custodial center. Now, with regards to your question, what are the what is the motive, the motivation of the perpetrators? Number one, there are members, quote and unquote, that are in detention. So if we look at um, hardened criminal groups, some of them, they are, uh, you know, commanders, leaders have been arrested. Uh, some of them convicted, some of them suspects. They are being held in those custodial centers. And one of the first motivation is to release them. Uh, as a commander, you had some privileges that you are no longer enjoying. And unfortunately, and I'm hoping we get to that conversation at some point, um, they are allowed to communicate with the outside world almost freely. This is something that we need to address. You cannot have a custodial center where you keep inmates and then you allow them to communicate with the outside world. It, there's no security there. Because what they study what happens in that place, they are able to even uh, tell precisely to their membership outside how security is organized within the custodial center, where there are gaps, where there are vulnerabilities, and then those are explo exploited. Now, um, secondly, you have terror suspects. Um, in the case of Kuji, we had over 40 of them. The part of the motivation of the attackers was to have, was to free them, and they succeeded in, in that. Um, again, there is a political angle to it, embarrass the government, like it happened under NSAS, show that the government is incapable, as it were, of protecting such an important asset. And then sometimes there are also criminal, uh, well, financially induced motivation. Um, a criminal group, somebody who has the capacity, capability, pays them, you know, whatever, uh, go and free or go and conduct that certain act. So, and then again, there is a social uh, angle to it, the grievances that exist within our society that allows sometimes the, you know, continuation of um, acts like what, what we are discussing at the you, moment. You, 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 you keep mentioning answers, and I've also, you know, read about some links you know, uh, with NSAS. Is, 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 do you think there's a direct correlation between NSAS protests and the exacerbation of jailbreaks? Well, definitely. Um, the, one of the key outcomes of NSAS was the direct targeting of um, custodial centers in the country across several locations. Uh, if I remember well, Delta, Edo, uh, Lagos, and several other locations, they directly targeted um, its custodial centers. Now, whether it was the actual initiators and, uh, you know, drivers of the NSAS, or it was the so-called hoodlums that infiltrated that movement, that carried it out, it's irrespective. It was a phenomenon that was documented, well documented actually, uh, regarding the direct targeting of custodial centers and unfortunately there was a positive correlation immediately after NSAS we saw an increase in criminal activities some of them unfortunately the, the perpetrators were actually identified as persons who have been freed so again maybe unwittingly or perhaps it was you know uh, an intended action uh, those who did that have not helped our uh, national security, unfortunately. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kabir Adamo. Uh, let's uh, now uh, bring in Chidi, Chidi Omeje. Mm -hmm. uh, what, in, in your opinion, 
does the bombardment of uh, Kujo prison uh, represent? Thank you. <clears throat> I think it represents uh, our uh, inefficiency and our, um, should I say, carelessness uh, in terms of um, handling uh, serious issues as you know, consider centers. Uh, it also represents the fact that uh, we, uh, by the way, we're not going to take in you know, isolation that this particular incident from mm -hmm. general insecurity across the country. Because it's it's a reflection of the totality of uh, insecurity, you know, banditry, terrorism, you know, armed robbery, all manner of uh, criminal syndicates in the poor. So um, the bombardment we saw uh, goes to show that. Uh, Probably a lot of things are not happening, uh, you know, are not in place. You all have expected a, a serious synergy you know, between and among, you know, security agencies that uh, man these uh, consular centers. Um, like you said, in his opening remark, if you are entering that particular center, you will see a number of uh, military personnel, blank detectives, robot policemen. I'm the custodial personnel, all of them, you know, positioned in different uh, places. Yet, they are unable to, uh, you know, stop this kind of attack or to foster the attack. It goes to show that there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a basic functional problem, you know, in, in the whole system. Because it is difficult to believe that um, a custodial center located right in the heart of the FCT close to the seat of power, where you have retinue of security, I mean, headquarters of security agents, military, security, intelligence and response agencies in the country, and yet we've had this back-to-back embarrassment and then committing to this particular most grievous uh, breach. Um, you see, Nigerians have seen a lot, and time has come for us to uh, sit back and have some introspection to see what we do right, what, how do we go about this. Uh, to me, uh, we, must have, we should go beyond going around. This is time to prefer solutions. How do we forestall future occurrence? It had happened already. The country is totally embarrassed, <coughs> the government is totally embarrassed, the people are confused, society is at risk. You know, we are emptying into the society, just like Kabir said, uh, you know, uh, hordes of. You know, um, hardcore terrorists and bandits, and not just the terrorists and bandits, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about also kidnappers, armed robbers, who, you know, in, in the case of terrorists, they, they could take time to probably go to their cocoon to reactivate their sleeper cells. But these other, uh, you know, hardcore criminals, immediately they let loose, they begin to operate. You see what happened in the area? Immediately they had that breach. Within weeks, you see a spike in insecurity across the other, that region. So it's always a terrible thing to have, um, you know, a, you know, prison. But we have to understand that prison, uh, cor sorry, correctional service, is at the heart of our you know, entire security architecture. Because you know, every other uh, agencies of state must submit their suspects, their whatever. The top place as a holding facility. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a mixture of all of characters, and now you have a situation where there's overcrowding, a situation where the, the, the facilities are not well fortified in terms of absence of technology, in terms of weak you know, personnel who have low motivation, you have absence of funding that are not quite appropriate. A lot of things are coming to play to give us this you know, terrible situation. So I, I believe that. Um, just like he said also, this particular incident is going to be a serious opener. It's, time, it's going to give us that push to sit back to say, wait a minute, is it about time we took our correctional centers seriously? Is it about time we think of how to um, you know, uh, improve on the physical security, the, uh, the postural security around the, around the system and everything that has to do with our, system, uh, our, our centers because, like I said before, it is at the heart of our security architecture. Every one of, every one of them submits to it because it's like a, it's like a bowl. You keep you put everything there. Mm -hmm. So what, the way you manage a particular bowl tells you how what will happen because if it's similar, you, you, you can expect 
a serious issue. So that's my initial, that's my first, uh, you know, uh, that's my re response to your question, really. Yeah. Mm, all right. Thank you, Chidi. Uh, back again to Dr. Uju Agomo. Uh, a former, uh, you know, boss of the uh, Correctional Center, in one of uh, you know the interviews he granted, mentioned the laxity of the staff of those centers as a main issue. You know why uh, this the custodial centers are easily. Uh, attacked and of course uh, why those attacks are successful I, I, I just like to ask the kind of freedom that is allowed the inmates by way of you know phone uh, you know pos possession of phones you know going in and out of of of, of the centers mm -hmm. of the consider centers you know getting information is it consistent with the you know overall objectives of those uh, correctional centers. Thank you. First of all, let me state that the inmates have rights to be in contact with their families, their lawyers, and their outside work. What is wrong is that these need to be fully regulated and monitored. The United Nations Standard Minimal Rules for the Treatment of Prisoners clearly states that this right is a right that every inmate need to be afforded, meaning they can, their families, they can be in touch with their families, they can be in touch with their lawyers, they can make phone calls. But this phone call should be, you know, like, imagine that you book in and say, I want to make a call. And as they are doing that, you are listening in, you are monitoring, you are tracking. The other point that we need to understand is that there are different categories of, or ought to be different categories of facilities as that is in compliance with the degree of risk that each of these inmates portray. So, for example, for maximum uh, inmates in the maximum security facilities and indeed high risk inmates, the conditions that are made or ought to be available for them should be different from what you do with, say, for example, inmates in the open facilities, open camp, like in Kakuri and the rest of that. So, that is a pretty good issue. So, what we need to do is there should be no reason why we should have phones inside the cells. That's wrong. So you need to do everything necessary to make sure that that, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen at all, at all. But you have to also make sure that there is proper access for the inmate to be able to make contacts. And then you monitor, you track, and all the rest of that. Now, you spoke about um, the how the staff, and again, uh, behave and I think I again you know my first comment was that what you see in correctional facilities is a reflection of what you see in the general community you know it, when you say that every country gets the kind of correctional center service that it deserves so the question here is what is the package for training for capacity building for motivation for providing incentive for providing welfare and all the rest of that for the staff now, so that you reduce the temptation that those staffs may be confronted with. And that's the same for everyone. And again, what are the levels of disciplines, checks and balances, monitoring in every aspect to ensure that indeed food is done? Section 2, subsection 1A of the Nigerian Correctional Service Act of 2019 clearly states that the objectives of the Act is, one, to help it to be in compliance with international human rights standards and good correctional practices. Good correctional practices. So again, I say to you, communication is a right. It's not a privilege, it's a right. But that right has to be made, you know, it's, as a matter of fact, through there, you can get a lot of intelligence that can help. But this needs to be well structured, well, you, you know, structured to do the needful. Again, let me also mention, it is also wrong for us to think that everyone who is in custody are all having uh, criminals. No. There are three categories of persons you find in custody. One, those who are innocent. Yes. There are people who are innocent. Two, the minor offenders, the petty offenders, who absolutely have no business being in custody. So you see, it's not just there. You have those who are innocent. But we also have those who are minor offenders and petty offenders who should actually be dealt with through non-custodial 
sanctions which already we have in the law but they're not effectively implementing and then of course the third aspect are the hardened offenders you know the criminals the 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 the, 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 the those hardened offenders so whichever category you have especially when you talk about the hardened offenders even if they are criminals you also have to be careful in terms of how you process them in terms of the kind of reformation activities rehabilitation activities and programming for full into reintegration why because only they die in custody they're going to come out someday so even if you don't like correctional service even if you don't talk like issue about inmates or ex-inmates but for our own safety and security in the community we must invest in that process we must so again on one aspect is the issue of compliance with issues about human rights on another aspect is the issue of ensuring that security is maintained and on the third tripod is the whole issue of the three arms reformation rehabilitation reintegration so that the whole notion of correction is put in place so again my answer is that we need to do what is necessary to ensure that these checks and balances are are put in place so that they won't be violated very much uh dr uh, agomo well uh back again to the former pro of the nigerian correctional service uh you listened to the comments that the other guests have raised uh, i i want to and i know that uh, dr cabrera damo was the one that first threw it in to say look uh, it's inmates have access to telephones uh, this of course wasn't the case before year 2001 before we had the gsm uh but in addition to uh, access to telephones and the right uh, basis uh, for that as dr agomo has also indicated there are allegations that sometimes the prison yard is is, is a marketplace it's a marketplace and that the managers of this market are the prison waters themselves the correctional services it is not just telephones that they have access to they have access to hard drugs you know, then uh, and so on and so forth uh, and that therefore uh you, you you find that attention drifts away from the real reason uh why it is us and them that is to say the inmates and then us who are supposed to be the managers to ensure that uh, these breaches such as we have seen lately uh, do not occur let's get your response to that please yeah uh, thank you very much um i think we need to clarify this issue of access to means of communication yes the standard minimum rule for the treatment of uh, uh, prisoner now mandela rule stipulates that every person in incarceration should be given the right to communicate with their loved ones including their lawyers but this is what we do it is it does not uh, translate to having every image with personal uh, means of communication. We have established offices in all our custodial facilities where inmates that so desire to communicate with any of their loved ones to assist. And these centers are manned by welfare officers. Dedicated lines are provided for. It's not the welfare officers are not even expected to come with their personal handsets. There are dedicated lines established for this purpose what the inmates will do is to approach the welfare officer and then declare your interest the person you want to call the the welfare officer will first of all place a call across to the person to establish that the person wants to speak with you once that one is done then the uh, uh, communication can be established as is 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 talking you are listening because you put it on, on speakerphone if and you give a condition the most converse in the language you understand or else you get an interpreter to be by your side so this is the established protocol and it's meant this is not to say however that we have not had incidents of you know uh, uh, people smuggling into this uh, into the center uh handset sometimes even hard drugs of course you would have seen severally that uh, staff or visitors Including the so-called legal representative coming in with hard roads, they have been intercepted and you know prosecuted. So in most cases, we we, we showcase this on different uh, platforms. So it is uh, it is not a, a privilege that is given to uh, people to you know abuse. It's strictly monitored, and where there are breaches, institutional mechanisms are also put in place are to you, address those 
and that are valid to the process. And your welfare uh, officers who monitor the calls, the conversations, are they also trained to detect when these you know, conversations are coded? Look, if they are coded, it's us. How, how would you know? No, it, see, how would they know? Well, the, 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 there are training processes. Each, uh, as, as a welfare officer, you are a communication uh, expert that are injected into that uh, process. It was, you know that the conversation is going out of course. That was why I said, before you establish that contact, you've called the person. Do you know so and so person? Where is he? And you be able to uh, start, you know, some uh, reasonable uh, uh, amount of information, the background of the person they want to establish that communication with. So if it's going out of hand, you... you, oh, you okay, uh, uh, tell us two things. Yes. How frequently is this right exercised? If I have a right to call my loved ones or my attorneys, I called them yesterday, uh, then again today I want to call them. I said, look, it looks like I'm having a runny tummy. Okay, that story you told me about uh, our auntie, well, what is the situation now? That is one. So how frequently is this right uh, allowed to be exercised by the prison officer? And then you also said that uh, there is uh, a prompt for the call. In other words, the welfare officer first puts the call uh, to the uh, receiver. But there are instances where calls come directly from inmates to receivers. That's what I'm saying now. That was why I said, this is not to say that we have not had witches. That is a situation where people smuggle in uh, uh, handsets into the, the yard. But to answer the first question, mm -hmm. it is so infrequent that, you know, okay, for instance, Kujie Custodial Center, where you have, as at the time the center was violated, they had uh, uh, 1,001 uh, inmates there. And the lines provided may not be more than two or three. So you can imagine the, the frequency of allowing one person to come and make repeated calls. No. And before you even do the call, do, what do you want to say? What do you want to what message do you want to pass across to this person? How is the person related to you? If it's your your counsel, your legal counsel, yes. Then we also get to know uh, that person who establish uh, his identity. If it's your wife, your children, or your what do you, after speaking with the person for one week, at least in the next two weeks, you 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 have no cause to say you want to rush back because whatever you need within the facility is provided. If you are sick, the hospital is there. If you need food, is there. If you need clothing, is there. So what we warrant your frequent call. So that one is not there. I, I want to quickly because I am always mindful of of, uh, of time. What we need to do, like I said, the facility when it was violated had a population of one thousand and one in it. Guess what? Those that were uh, uh, awaiting trial were 797. 79% awaiting trial. And this is the ugly picture you see across the country, particularly consular centers established in, in uh, 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 urban centers. So we need to rejig our trial process, our court trial process. And I also want to let you know that most of these people that are awaiting trial, so 90 percent of them even committed state offenses that's right so what what, what is our state uh, 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 judicial doing okay you know it, 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 it's, 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 it's the president we'll say come back to i'd like to bring in dr kabir uh, adam and uh, again referencing a former you know as uh, cg of recreational centers interview you know he said what happened at uh uh, is, is it a Kutun Kaufe? Yes, Kutun Kaufe. Uh, he, he gave a vivid picture of what happened, that some of the inmates had gone out and brought in two by four timber, went inside their cells, and started, you know, burying holes through the walls. And while they were doing that, you know, they were drumming and singing as if the wound, when one of them is being discharged and all that. So it drowned, you know, uh, you know, the noise and, you know, prevented the... You know. Now, he said, laxity is a major part on the part of, you know, the, the staff of the custodial centers. But that's not the case with Kuchi. According to the interior minister, Kuchi is the most fortified if, if, you know, of all the centers, it had the complement of troops and all that. 
So do you think this is, you know, um, an issue of lack of equipment or personnel, you know, uh, uh, um, responsive, lack of, you know, the response from the personnel, from the troops, from the security guys that were there? Oh, uh, because I don't understand. Yeah. Um, to, uh, to a lay, Maybe sleeping? Uh, to a lay person, um, it, may, it may seem fortified. But to, to all of us here, and if we are speaking sincerely, um, it's extremely vulnerable uh, from different pre prisms, from an internal perspective as well from an external perspective. The 101 on security that my co-discussant here mentioned, uh, detecting, uh, denying, delaying, deterrence, response, that is in each of these layers, if you pick, we can spend one hour speaking about the vulnerabilities that exist and that still exist, not just in Kuji, but in several other aspects. Um, I run a consultancy, and I can tell you that as early as me, I started picking up chatter in Kuji that there were foreign, you know, adversaries, persons. And we know that there were bandits who were attacking residents, abducting them. Now, additional persons joined those bandit groups. They were not working together with them. And that is when someone within that system, perhaps within the correctional services, perhaps within other security organizations, should have picked up that intelligence and say, look, there is a critical infrastructure there within Kuji. What is the level of protection, the security posture of that infrastructure? Now, let, let me give you a scenario. And this is something that happens across the country. You have 100 persons coming on motorbikes, each of them with the most basic of um, uh, got firepower that they come with is an AK-47 uh, with two magazines, 60 bullets in those, in those two magazines. Now, uh, assuming and going by the statement, with due respect to the Minister of Interior, that what we had in that place is a protection of 100 persons. And I know that they were not even up to that up to a hundred persons now juxtapose that with the adversary coming on a hundred bikes with 100 um uh, ak-47 each of them with two magazines what do you think would happen for a, a, a firefight that lasted two hours but but but, but Kabiru, assuming again 100 or 300 whatever the number may be coming to a place like kuji in the f city and not a single intelligence um, so again, that's, I mean, why, that's why I told you to, uh, to a lay person it may seem like that. I started my, 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 my response to you by mentioning the four layers of security or five layers, depending on what you want to go with. And I just give you the example of one. There was intelligence. I'm sorry to say there was intelligence. If I, as a private practitioner, had picked up that intelligence, I'm almost certain uh, that the government public security department had picked up that intelligence. What they did with that intelligence is, to, is totally different. And I'm hoping that the committee that is investigating this matter would look into that issue. Was intelligence picked? Who was that intelligence shared with? What responses were put in place as a result of that in, in intelligence? Um, the, the point we made earlier on around communication within the correctional services, it's very easy for an inmate who already is talking to his you know, partners outside to give a vivid description of the security arrangement within the custodial center. Now, already he's communicating with outside. They know that, let's say, there are 70 you know, armed persons uh, within and outside the security. So they are coming, they come with perhaps, like we, we not, noted, one between 100 and 200. So again, and this is why I'm just trying to make the point that our correctional services are vulnerable. They are vulnerable not just because of the external factors which we have discussed, the threat factors who are coming to attack, but also because of internal factors within them. And perhaps we can discuss around physical security. Uh, earlier, and I think it was Dr. Uju that mentioned it, there are provisions within the 2021 oh. Act that shows clearly what should be. Now, none of that is being implemented, as if that is not good enough. If we go back to the example you gave in Kwaton Karafi, the integrity of the Stru structure is another issue. In certain instances, um, I can't remember which of them, it was the rainfall that actually washed a part of the wall that gave the opening which the 
inmates took advantage. So again, um, as an expert, what I would do if I'm doing an assessment is to pick these four layers. Each one of them is a checklist. You tick, you tick, you tick. Now that has been done in the case of Kuji. And it was interesting, the, the outcome. Believe me, in each of the layers, the number of vulnerabilities identified, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> probably none of us will be able to sleep based on the outcome of that assessment. So, again, with due respect to the Honorable Minister, our correctional services are vulnerable. Well, Dr. Kabir, uh, thank you. I mean, it's, 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 we'll not be able to sleep. I, I mean, you'll get, <laughs> since uh, the Kuji uh, prison assault, you know, people will be calling you and say, well, we hope you are okay. We hope you are all right. I mean, we hear that uh, these criminal elements have been uh, let loose in the, in the city yeah. and, and in the suburbs. Uh, that's the point. But, uh, uh, should you imagine, yes. I, I would like us to talk about something. Yeah. Look, our correctional facilities or prisons as they were, they are not new uh, institutions. Uh, they are not new facilities. They have been there. And when we say, oh, the perimeter walls are not available, this one is not available, this one is not there, Ordinarily, from a management point of view, the question that arises is, what is it that the correctional service itself has been doing? Do you just wake up and go to work every morning and say, the world is not good, mm -hmm. so do it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I just keep asking myself. I mean, if you run a business, I'm not saying that a prison is a business, but if you manage a facility, are you going to say, oh, this is another, if the facility is vulnerable, and you yourself, you are working there, you become part of that vulnerability. It appears that nothing has been done. Okay, during one of the uh, visitations, I think by the pre it was the president himself mentioned that, the senior president also mentioned it, there is a watchtower. And apparently inadequate and probably outdated. Yeah. No CCTV. Does any person need to tell you in this day and age that you need to have a CCTV all over the place? Just by watching television and watching documentaries, you see how modern prison facilities are wrong. Yeah. So what in your opinion is, is, is the mentality of the managers of, of these services? The mentality of the managers of these uh, facilities we are talking about is the same mentality we have across board. I, I don't want to pin this matter on the benevolence of the correctional facilities. We have government in place. By the way, we have had uh, prison breaks in the past, and I'm sure we could split uh, committee panels to you know to study what happened and bring the reports. I think it's about time for the NSA, for instance, to review those reports to see where there are you know lessons to be learned. Now, of course, like you rightly said. Uh, our prisons are m mostly medieval. We don't have we don't have we don't have prisons that we could, can, can compare to any in other crime. Uh, we, we watch films and we see that um, in some other countries, actually, even in Africa, those who manage our prisons are well taken care of, are well trained, are well motivated, are well equipped. How come we are not able to? You know, the thing is, we, 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 in the peck of order of uh, all these security and response agencies, you see that the prisons almost are at the base. Meanwhile, they ought to play a much more critical role. But, um, you see, it, it's always easier for us to look from afar and see, uh, and be able to, uh, you see, what, what, are, what are the managers doing. But the managers also have people who supervise them. And we have ministry, ministry of internal affairs, uh, internal affairs. We have the office of the NSA. We have, the, of course, the prison. These are institutions that know exactly the essence of prison as as a, as as an instrument in the whole security architecture, the importance of it. Yet we are not able to mainstream technology in, in all, all of this. We are not able to put like the government said, come on CCTV. Well, we are being expected that we have to have drones to be able to you know pick in intelligence. We, have, we say we have a uh, capital, we have a, comp a huge complement of uh, security, um, you know, different security forces. How come that this is easy to compromise? So the point is, our, we, we are not paying attention to our prisons. We are not seeing it as important. Then when, when this kind of thing happened, now we begin to discuss it. How, how, when was the last time we sat down to talk about Nigerian prisons, Nigerian correspondence services? Well, nobody remembers them. It's only when we have this kind of compromise.
Then you say, oh, we have peasants. Meanwhile, it is the same peasant that you have, you know, that there's actually a, a potential for 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 breach of security in the country. Now you can imagine what's happening. You can imagine what those that, that particular uh, number. You said forty, but I, what I read was about sixty-three. You know, hardcore terrorists getting loose. Can you picture in your mind what they're, they're up to right now? Are they trying to activate their sleeper cells across the city or across across the, uh, the region or across the country? Have they gone back to not to 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 fortify their members, or have they gone to north northwest, or have they gone to north south, or all of the forests to constitute uh, security problem? So these are the issues. So my question is, how come we only remember correctional service when we have this problem? Why, uh, why are we not proactive if we understand that prisons? Uh, okay, correctional, correctional uh, custodial service are uh, important uh, in our security. TV, thank you. Let, let's <laughs> yeah. just put this uh, discussion on hold. Yeah. And then the last question, again, when we come back, we'll be asking is again, has government, federal government, state government, paid adequate attention in terms of budgeting, uh, you know, to deal with capital infrastructure, the renovation we're talking about, uh, are those correctional? Uh, centers. Of course, that will be when we come back from this break. Don't go away. All right, welcome back. You're watching Good Morning Nigeria, and we are looking at you know uh, solution to the incessant uh, jail breaks in Nigeria. Uh, before we went on break, I, I, I talked about um, what government was doing, you know, in, in its own part to fund. You know the, the the centers, and you know, Mr. Nobera. Just before we bring in uh, Dr. Uh, Agomo, I had on one of the programs here uh, a former controller general of 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 this of the centers, um, and he spoke glowingly about the reformations he undertook during his tenure. And I'm talking about Jafaru Ahmed. The infrastructural turnaround he was able to bring to the centers, the vehicles he procured and distributed nationwide to effect, you know, transfer of you know inmates so that um, the, the the centers can be the, the you know centers can be decongested. He also talked about a lot of things he did. And if you look at the budgetary allocation that this government has made from 2015 till now, you can't say that this government hasn't tried to fund the custodial centers. Yes, uh, thank you very much. There's no doubt that uh, the in fairness to the present uh, government, uh, this is about the only time we've had significant attention, interest, intervention from the federal government to improve the lot of uh, uh, custodial centers in Nigeria. Recall that we have always had cause to say, look, our structures are medieval, like uh, uh, one of the panelists uh, rightly put it. The, most of them were inherited from uh, colonial master and all of that. What happened during the administration of uh, the, the immediate past controller general of uh, correction, Jafar Ahmed, was that there was a kind of... Uh, risk and need at uh, assessment of the consider centers we have across the country. These things were compiled and the then Minister of Interior, Gerard Abaza, made it possible for a direct presentation by the uh, 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 Controller General to the uh, uh, National Economic uh, uh, Executive Council. Right there and then, vivid pictures were presented of each of those uh, locations we have in the country. So that was perhaps I want to believe what further motivated the government to you know increase the budgetary allocation to the service and what did that translate to we were able to uh, intervene uh, structurally across board offices uh, 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 prisoners association cells and then we came up with the concept of 3,000 ultra modern custodial centers built to uh, accommodate the present uh, security challenges facing the country. We have one in Janguza, in Kano State. That one is, is, is close to 95% completion. Anywhere from now, I'm sure it will be commissioned and put to use. We have another one coming up in Karishi, here in the Federal Capital Territory. We have another one in Bori, a, a river state, oh. at, yeah, and uh, the two other uh, three geopolitical zones you know, waiting to take off. So the idea 
was to activate uh, uh, the, the kind of a structural integrity that will enable the service contained at the uh, VUs, that is a violent extremist offenders we have. Closely related to that is the passage of the Nigeria Correctional Service Act 2019. Recall that that bill for 12 years were uh, uh, moving back and forth. But it was this administration that had the boldness to uh, uh, pass that bill. And what, uh, uh, what do we harvest from that bill? A lot. The consider management, the reformation and rehabilitation of, uh, of uh, image, and if we want to talk about the present security uh, uh, issue we, that is facing us, Section 9, Subsection 3 in that Act clearly spells out how to establish buffer area. I keep saying this because, like I said uh, at the beginning, we still have hiding criminals in our custody. And Dr. Kabir uh, alluded to the fact that most of our constitutional uh, centers, as they are presently constituted, still remain vulnerable. What do we do? We need to immediately estimate the construction of those uh, 3,000 capacity uh, ultra-modern uh, uh, constitutional centers. Number one. Then number two, we need to relocate constitutional centers that have been eaten up by urbanization. If you go to, I don't want to mention uh, uh, all over the, the country, you see most of our constitutional uh, uh, centers are literally in Market Square. How do you operate a uh, consular center like that and you keep adding criminals in there? Whether you have plateau of, of uh, uh, to guide them or not, if times comes for, for, for exchange of bullet, what happens? Where do you shoot? Where do you maintain buffer area? How do you assess who is coming in? And if you talk to those that, that, that are living around those uh, private developers, they quickly run to court to seek injunction. And I keep saying, injunction will not stop bullets. Because if if the if the if if uh, uh, time comes for re exchange of fire, because as the, the, the uh, we are gradually uh, transiting now, uh, men will be beat up, high caliber military uh, weaponry will be deployed, and while you are doing that, you 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 you, you, you may not avoid uh, unintended casualties, yeah. collateral collateral damage will, will be high. So it is high time we begin to think of. You know, relocating these facilities and put them in a place or in places where they can be adequately defended. Okay. In other words, thank you very much. And also, thanks for the information you provided as to new facilities that are under construction. Uh, I hope that this is not following our national mentality. We are always very good at initiating fresh projects fresh fresh and then allied to that unfortunately as a drawback poor maintenance culture of existing exactly. infrastructure mm -hmm. so as we have as you mentioned these ones that are going ahead now new one bori kano uh, karashi here in abuja the question then arises what would it cost to install cctvs in existing infrastructure, <laughs> existing facilities. What will it cost to at least show up mm -hmm. the integrity of existing facilities? It is said as if when the ones at Bori, Kano, Karishi, and elsewhere in the political zones, once they are completed, then you will pull down these ones. They will still be in existence. How do you maintain these existing ones? How do you deploy technology as part of it? I think that that is the issue. I mean, the question is not for you to respond to. I'm just, it's, it's a rhetorical question. I, 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 no, I, 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 I want to go over to. Uh, okay, 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 right, right, okay, very quickly. Yes. Okay, uh, uh, good. Uh, the, if the current uh, projects are completed, what the advantage it will uh, provide is that we will be able to isolate hardened criminals from these uh, facilities that we cannot guarantee sufficiently their integrity to those to, to the new ones that are being built. That I can assure you. And then let me quickly say this: mm. it's unfortunate so that when I when I had it, you don't need a CCTV. I mean, yes. You know, you do, I mean, don't you need the CCTV? I mean, just to get along. Suppose, okay, suppose the whole idea is to say, uh, uh, no, no, well, let's not get into that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, because you, I mean, correctional services officers are law enforcement officers. Some persons might just say, look, you know, let's face them. Uh, we have had instances uh, uh, during the NSAS protest 
when they stormed uh, the uh, prisons in Benin, two of them, one on Saple Road, which is uh, opposite the hospital and uh, by the High Court, the other one at Oko, and freed uh, the inmates who were there, running into about almost 2,000. One of those inmates was reported to have uh, gone after either the prosecutor or a prosecution witness and they put him to sleep. Yes, uh, look, I to maintain the existing structure. Mm. We have our maintenance uh, unit that always carry out these uh, uh, regular uh, maintenance of our but for the new ones. Yeah. For the new ones, they are. I, I don't want to. I don't want to go into detail of the security features that are in the new. Ones. I said. I said they are tailored to withstand the current security challenges facing us. That's, that's what I want to Okay, do. that's fine. No, but let's not get into detail. But mm -hmm. what we also do know, we have read about some of these things. We have also seen them in movies. This one that you, you earlier described, the current practice, uh, an inmate wants to make a phone call, uh, a welfare officer is there. Some of them, there's a glass panel. Yeah. A glass, it's on visiting days that you can have a conversation. On visiting days, and then if there's a there's a it's speaker. Okay. That's a, it's an intercom, that not the telephone that you pick up a telephone. Yes. And say, ah, how you doing now? How, how are things? Uh, 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 no, this water, that place, they uh, not very far. From, uh, uh, that's not the kind of. We're talking about a glass panel, and you use an intercom to have the communication, and then you get back into the car. Doctor uh, 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 Ujo Agomo. Uh, again, we're getting pressed for time, but. I recall we, we had you as a guest on Good Morning Nigeria sometime in the past. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues, of course, along with Professor Alemika, the issue here about the congestion of our prisons. I know there is a committee, I don't know whether they have uh, concluded their, their assignment, uh, headed by the former Chief Judge of the Federal Capital Territory, uh, Honorable Justice Ishak Bello, uh, that we're working around on issues of decongesting the prisons. but. A good number of, of the of the prison facilities are populated by persons who are awaiting trial or small time offenders. A number of them, as has also been indicated, are persons who have either committed they are alleged to have committed state offenses or have been convicted for state offenses. Now, the issue I raised on one occasion had to do with what needs to be done to move the prisons from the exclusive list. So the concurrent list, and I think it's one of the items uh, for amendment uh, to, to the uh, constitution, whether that has been done, and, and what incentive would that be uh, for state governments to provide their own correctional or prison facilities? I know that uh, Aqua Ibom built one, probably a medium security prison somewhere around the Kotek Manila, but there was a challenge there recently. But what can be done to expedite that so that offenders of, of, uh, of, of state statutes can't go to state facilities. I mean, if I committed an offense today, for instance, a state offense, uh, say, outside of the federal capital territory, where I will go to will be a federal facility. Uh, th thank you very much. First, uh, let me just say, because of the last comment you made when we were discussing with uh, uh, Francis and uh, Nobor, uh, just to say that in terms of communication with the outside world, contact via phone is one aspect, but there is also visits. So what you were describing is about types of visits, and they do have some forms of visit. I mean, there are some challenges, but that is also another option. Maybe when we have time, we can discuss about what are the challenges and what are the gaps and what needs to be done regarding that. So apart from visits, apart from tell, uh, letter writing, which these days are not as often as it used to be before, there is also the issue about visits and whether these facilities have adequate space for to enable those visits to take place. Now, to the question that you have asked in terms of the rule um, uh, regarding the state government and also in terms of the rule regarding the presidential committee uh, for uh, prison decongestion and, and, and corrections, which uh, my lord uh, um, Justice Ishak Bailiff, former chief judge of FCT, was uh, chairing and I think he's still chairing. Uh, my, my, my understanding is that committee is still on. Uh, and I, let me just still say this that in terms of who determines who gets out of any facility, custodial facility, it rests on the judiciary. And in this time, it has to be the chief judge and indeed the judiciary in that state in relation to the cases that are before the courts that are within that state. Okay? But there are already mechanisms that sh this should make this happen. And I want to say it and uh, state this very categorically. 
what we need to do you know when we talk about what needs to be done we've talked about what needs to be done in terms of security but i think that also if you remember i mentioned about the issue of emergency declaring an emergency uh, situation for justice and security sector at the moment in nigeria all the judiciary and of government across the state need to do the needful i mean it 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 is it is sad to see the number of persons that waiting trial we've discussed this already before so again what they need to do to be help you look at the state core element of it you see the role of the state in terms of what the attorney state attorney general needs to do what are the cases that he needs to enter a only prosecute on which means he says i'm no longer doesn't prosecuting what are the cases that he needs to ensure that the due prosecution takes place the state judiciary who are the persons who are in custody what needs to be done within that parameter to ensure that you do not have high number of persons awaiting trial and i mean it sometimes 10 years 15 years what are you doing how can you be 15 years or more you have not concluded the matter sometimes these people stay longer than they would have stayed even if that matter has been uh, uh the, the person had been sentenced so the judiciary they also look at the remand homes in terms of the juvenile justice this is also something that needs to be provided by the state as we know there's only maybe about only three busters which is managed by the nigerian correctional service across the whole country yeah maybe about that but you know that that is not enough in terms of dealing with the whole notion of juvenile in juvenile justice that's why you see a lot of young offenders in the custody that's another thing that we need to discuss you talked about the bill yes i'm aware that there is a bill in terms of pushing issue of correction to, to, uh, to the uh, uh, concurrent um, legislative mix so that both the state and the uh, federal government can have a role can i plead that we should have an approach which i call the whole of society approach meaning not only the state government but also the local government because even in terms of local government areas in terms of the non-custodial element look at Quara, for example Quara fct they are providing support for to establishing non-custodial centers working with the nigerian correctional service non-custodial element so you don't have to wait till these things are sent to his, the concurrent legislative list before you do something i think that every nigerian every private sector every local government area every state government and indeed the federal should do the need for and one thing like that keep coming to my mind you know how many people saw the persons who were marching to go and attack kuje how many saw it how many said anything about it so you see something you say something but part of it is that there's completely lack of confidence and trust how do we ensure that nigerians will trust the system we must ensure that we begin to end back this trust of the public both by the justice system and also the security system many times people are not going even to the former sector because they are tired they are confused they have lost trust again can i plead can i plead and plead again as a nation can we take this thing seriously for once it's not a matter of committees and meetings there is a law set up there are no people who know what the things that needs to be done can we do it how can we have nigerian correctional service act a whole part two or non custodian and not a penny release for it are we for real are we sure of what we're doing to ourselves and the problem is that this thing is about the security of you and i i mean i don't understand i don't understand and i don't understand please again i am i'm using this opportunity can we begin there are 244 custodial centers across the country there are about 30 of them that we have high number of overcrowding all in cosmopolitan Dr. Ujua Gomo, uh, I, I can feel the vibration of your, of your anger and passion, but uh, I think uh, we'll just keep you on hold and then return to uh, the studio here to just to take the last uh, a few comments from uh, Kabiru uh, Adamo. Uh, and I, 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 I'm, just, I'm just wondering, um, is, is, is there a way the National Assembly, you know, can be helpful in this regard they make laws and some of these laws have not been you know implemented but they also oversight you know those laws no definitely um the in in essence the custodial center is an arm of the executive and so where there are gaps uh, in terms of the checks and balance that are instituted within our democratic system that gap should be corrected by the national assembly through its three Key functions: the legislation function, 
the oversight function and then the budgetary function. So a lot of what has been identified in the course of our conversation can actually go back to the legislature. Yes, the responsibility, especially when it comes to accountability, even the executive arm of government. Mm -hmm. But where that failure, and that's what we have identified here, if I'm taking one, uh, one thing out of our conversation here, is that there were failures. And that failure squarely rests on the hand of the executive arm of government, especially the, I'm sorry to say, the Ministry of Interior that has responsibility for the correctional services. Of course, it trickles down mm -hmm. to even the warden who does not do his function. But then as the leader of that particular sector, you hold, you are, respon you are responsible. Now, where that hasn't happened, the arm of government that should ensure it happens is the legislative arm of government through the three things that we've mentioned. So I'm hoping that going forward, this is what we should do. Of course, the judiciary too has, has, has an, a role, like we've clearly identified. If there are 79% of inmates within a particular custodial center uh, waiting trial, then as you can see clearly, it's a responsibility that is shared among all the three arms of government. Uh, I'll just, I'll just, I don't know we're signing the guys now, but it's just something that probably can be done in terms of recruitment into the correctional service. I, I, I say this with the greatest respect to them, and this is not a joke. Uh, where do you see a good, some of the uh, correctional services staff, or prison warders, as we used to call them? A number of them look like lightweights. Lightweights. And uh, uh, elsewhere, I mean, as in some other jurisdictions, you ought to, there is, there's some uh, physical requirement in terms of your features uh, because there could be riots inside a prison and they would target prison officers, you know. So you look at some of them and you're just wondering, I, I mean, it's just something that we can do in terms of uh, upping the uh, physical features requirements of some of these officers. And I've, I've asked this question not as a joke, but also with the greatest respect to the prison officers. So to upgrade the requirements to what we know. <laughs> not necessarily wait. I'm just talking about, I'm just talking about it. I mean, when you see, there are some guys you would see and you would say, look, I can't mess with this word. You put meant for me. Okay, okay. Yes, uh, uh, yes, yes, we have always uh, made repression for the recruitment of additional personnel. There's no doubt about that. But let me quickly say this. Uh, no, we, no, what we are, I'm just talking yes, about the yeah, it's always is 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 part of uh, the requirement that we built in 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 our portal. And then let me quickly say this: uh, where we have, we all know that we are facing general security across the country, and. Uh, the Nigeria Correctional Service, nobody is remembering that we have been able, we were able to stave off COVID-19, that no image, despite the nature of our, uh, of our consciousness that suffered COVID-19 in uh, okay. all the pandemic we have had in the past. Okay. So we should also uh, look at that uh, area yeah. of... Uh, okay, okay. I think to, to go back to your question, I think uh, yeah. probably because correctional service is no longer very attractive to Nigerians, owing to the fact that you know, we don't pay attention to them, we don't fund them, we don't give them the work for the desired people, we don't go to other, you know, uh, agencies where they, they believe uh, it's better. But I think that's something we're not forgetting. No, you, you don't have the time for that. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> the OMJ, Publisher of Security Digest, thank you very much. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, let, me, let me appreciate Dr. Uju Agomo, Executive Director. Prisoners Rehabilitation and Welfare Action, Prawa. Uh, always a pleasure to have you on Good Morning Nigeria. Thank you very much. And Francis uh, Nobore, former PRO Nigerian Correctional Service. Thank you. Oh, and thank uh, you look good in retirement. And Golden Dr. Kabiru Damu, Security Risk Management Expert. He says uh, there's rice and stew very plenty after this program. <laughs> thank you, uh, Kabiru. My pleasure. And, okay, that's it. And Good Morning Nigeria for today. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Tomorrow is another day. And that will be Friday. I am Claire Adela Boabdozak. I'll see you then. I am Kingsley. You'll say, look after yourselves. And have a nice day.